Welcome to part 4 of this YSL tutorial series on basic programming in Visual C Sharp. In this part of the series we're finally going to get into writing some basic C Sharp code, and we'll begin by explaining how you can get access to the events of a form so that you can attach code to them. We'll talk about a few of the standard code elements you're likely to see within your forms, some auto-generated system code, and then we'll get into writing your own simple methods. We'll begin by explaining how to add a comment, and then we'll use the message box class as a simple way to demonstrate how to write basic code. We'll look at how the IntelliSense list works to make sure you get as much help as possible when you're writing your code, talk about standard things like passing values into parameters, and also how to refer to objects, how to apply methods to those objects, and then how to use those objects' properties. So it's a relatively simplistic set of code we're going to write, but it will give you a nice grounding in, in understanding how to write simple C-sharp code. So let's get started. In the previous part of this series, we looked at how to design basic Windows Forms. What we're going to do now is open up that form and attach some very basic c -sharp code to it, so that it responds to user input. So to start with, you'll need the project you created in the previous part of the series. If you haven't got a copy of this already, then I will make a copy available for download. It might not be available immediately, but I will put a link in the description at the bottom of the video. If you do have a copy, then head to the file menu and you'll need to open it. So if you've been working on it recently, you can use the recent projects and solutions list and select your Woda application, remember Wiseal's dating agency. Um, alternatively, you can browse for the file or the project you want to open by clicking open project and choosing the solution file from within there. I'm going to choose recent projects and solutions and open up my Woda solution. And eventually I'll end up with the form that I designed last time, a um, single form with a few controls on it and a button to which I would like to attach some code. If you want to attach some code to a control on a form, you'll need to access that control's events. And the simplest way by far to access the default event for a control is to just double click on it. So if I did double click on my apply now button, it would generate the default event handler for that object, which happens to be the click event. And that's actually the one that I want. I want something to happen when a user clicks on my button. There are many other events that can happen to a button though, not just a click. And if you want to see what they all are, then you can select a control and then use the properties window to see them. So in the properties window, if I select the button again, I just accidentally unselected it, um, there's an events tab, so the little lightning flash symbol allows you to see the events of the controller you've selected. So if I click on the events tab, it will show me a full list of all of the events for the object. So you can see that if you select other objects or other controls on the form, like a combo box, or a text box, or even a label, they all have events associated with them, so you can attach code to any single one of those events for any single control. To get access to the click event of the button then, rather than just double clicking on it, what I can also do is select the button and then double click the click event. So if I do that now, it will launch and generate the default event handler for the click event of the apply now button. I can switch between the design view and the code view of an object fairly easily when both windows are still open, simply by clicking on the tabs at the top of the screen. So if I want to get back to the design view, no problem, click on the design tab, code view, click back on the code tab. If one of those windows was closed, so for instance if I close down the, uh, the code tab and I want to get back to the code view, then one thing I can do as well as going through the events list again, I can right click on part of the form and choose view code or one of its controls and view code, and that will take me straight back to the, to the code view as well. If both windows were closed down, I can use the Solution Explorer to open various parts. So obviously we know that we can double click on an item to open it, so if I double clicked on the Woda application form, that would open up in the design view. The Woda application form itself is comprised of several different items. If I expand that node, I'll see that in there is another option called Woda application form. This symbol here represents the partial class which is something we'll explain a little bit later on in the video series. But with this icon, if I double click on this item, that will open up the code view. If I close that down, I can even get to an individual component of the code view. So if I um, move the properties window down a little bit and expand the, this node, you'll see all the individual items stored inside that class. So the thing we've just created there, the apply now button click event, if I double click on that, it will take me straight back to the code view, selecting the specific item that I've double clicked on. So there's a number of different ways to get back to the same place. One last way to do it is if I close down the code view again, and then I'm going to open up the design view of the form, so I'm going to double click on it. If I select my apply now button and look at the events list, I'll see that there's a click event attached to, or an event handler attached to the click event. So again, if I double click on the click event here, it will take me straight back to the code that I've been writing, or the click event that we've generated. 
Now, before we start writing any of our own code, it's worthwhile quickly mentioning a few of the things that have been written for us automatically. So at the top of the page, as we're looking at it, we've got something called namespace woda. Woda is a reference to the name of the project in which all of our code is stored, and the namespace keyword is used to declare a scope for other identifiers declared within it. So within the namespace that we've declared here, namespace woda, we've got a few other items or a few identifiers. They're all contained within this set of curly braces. So this open curly brace here and this closed curly brace here correspond to each other. You can collapse and expand all of the items within a set of curly braces using the plus and minus symbols at the left hand side of the screen. Everything in our woda project is contained within the woda namespace. So for example, if I opened up my program file by double clicking on it, we'll see that that also has namespace woda at the top containing a list of other identifiers. I can close that down and go back to the code behind the form. Sitting above the namespace declaration is a set of what are called using directives. If I scroll the screen upwards, we'll see that we've got quite a few of those in this simple code page. So each using directive is used to bring the items stored in another namespace into the scope of the code we're writing. So you'll see we've got a system namespace which contains a number of items, there's a collections namespace within that and a generic namespace within that, and each one of these namespaces contains a group of related code. When we use a using directive it means it makes it easier for us to call the items from these namespaces into the code we're writing in our current code page. So a namespace is really just a neat way to organize code into different groups of related items. We can add as many using statements as we like to the top of a, a code page, and later on in the series we'll be doing exactly that. For now we're just going to stick with the standard using directives we've been given. We don't need to add any more to write the basic sort of code we're writing. So within our world in namespace within this file, we've got a number of other items declared. Starting at the top, we've got this public partial class world application form colon form. Now the word class indicates that this is a, essentially a blueprint for a type of object. C sharp is an object oriented language, so the main things you work with in C sharp are referred to as objects, and every object is based on a class definition. So the class defines how the, how the object works, what methods it has, and what properties it has. So we've got a, a class called Woda Application Form, whose name is clearly taken from the name of the form we created in the previous video. The colon form after its name indicates that this form inherits some of its methods and properties from another class called form. So there's a generic form class defined by the, the template that we're working on, so this Windows Forms application, and our Woda application form inherits certain of its properties and methods from that class. The word public indicates that this class is available to any part of our Woda project, so we can reference this Woda application form and create new instances of it from any other file within this project. And the word partial indicates that not the entire definition of this class is stored in this one single file. So in fact, I can quickly show you that certain other aspects of the Woda application form are defined in another part of our project. If I expand the Woda application form node in the Solution Explorer, we've also got this file called Woda application form .designer.cs. If I open up this file by double clicking on it, we'll see that this also has a Woda namespace and immediately within it, we've got a partial class Woda application form. So some of the code, some of the definitions of our Woda application form are defined in this file and some of its aspects are defined in the Woda application form.cs file. Immediately within the definition of our class is a public method called Woda application form. A method is one kind of procedure that can be stored within a class. It's indicated that it's public, which means it can be referenced from outside of the class. And the fact that it has exactly the same name as the class itself indicates that this particular method is also the constructor for the class. A constructor is a procedure which runs automatically whenever a new instance of our class gets created. So one place where that happens is in our main program file. If I double click on the program file in the Solution Explorer to open it, we'll see that when our program runs in the main method, we have a line which creates a new instance of our Woda application form. When this line of code runs, it automatically triggers the constructor for the Woda application form class, so any code stored in there will also be run automatically. Now the only thing that this particular constructor does is call on another method called initialize component. So essentially when this method runs, it tells the code to run another procedure. 
Just by looking at its name you've got no idea what it does or where it's stored, but you can find that out by right clicking on the name of the method that's being called and choose to view, go to its definition. You could also just press the F12 key. If I choose go to definition it will open up the file that contains the initialized component method and you'll see that it's part of the same form we were just looking at, the word application form designer.cs, so it's part of the file we just looked at that contains another part of the partial definition of our class. So this method initialize component does a number of things to set up the form, so it adds all of the controls, sets their properties, draws the form on screen, so there's an awful lot of stuff that happens in there. We don't really want to change anything there, we want our form to work in the way it should. So I'm going to close down that particular code page to go back to our Woda application form.cs file. So finally onto the method that was generated when we created an event handler for the click event of our apply now button. It's a private method, which means it can only be referenced from within its class. The word void indicates that it doesn't return a value, so when we call on the method it will run any instructions stored within it, but it won't return anything. The method also has two parameters, one's called sender as an object, and that's a reference to the object which triggered the event. There's also this argument or parameter called e, event args, and this essentially returns a number of different bits of information about the event itself. We don't need to worry about either of these two parameters for now. All we're going to do is write some basic code in this method and see that it's triggered when we click our apply now button. Before we write some code to perform any actions, we're going to add some comments that describes what the method will do. Comments are completely optional in your code, but it's a useful thing to do when you're first getting started, or even later on when you want to remind yourself what's been happening in your subroutines. So to add a single comment to a single line, start the line with a, with a pair of forward slashes. So making sure that you've clicked inside the set of braces for this method, type in two forward slashes. You might just notice that the text turns dark green, and after this you can type in pretty much whatever you want. So I'm going to say this method displays um, a message when the user clicks a button. So there's no worry about punctuation here, anything that follows the forward slashes is completely ignored by the editor when you run the procedure. So at the end of the line I'm just going to press enter, and that's the, the simple way to add a comment. If you want to add a comment at the start of the next line, then again you can type in two forward slashes and write out a new comment. But that can get a bit tedious when you want to do that for multiple lines. So instead, if you type in a forward slash and an asterisk, then each subsequent line that you write when you press enter gives you an asterisk at the start, and essentially you've got what's called a multi-line comment. So this is a multi-line comment. When you want to finish writing your multi-line comments on the next line, backspace the space in front of the asterisk and type in a forward slash after it and that ends the comment line so the next line when you press enter won't have a comment on it. And that's probably a little bit of overkill for such a simple procedure so what I'm going to do is delete those multi-line comments by selecting them all using the mouse and just pressing the backspace or the delete key and that will get rid of them and what we can do now is actually go about writing some code that will do something useful. So to display a message on screen, I'm going to use something called the message box. And to write the instruction that displays that, I need to pick any line of code in this procedure, so anywhere within the curly braces. And yet you can use blank lines. You can lay out your code more neatly or space things out using blank lines. It doesn't have any impact on the way your code runs. If I know the, the name of the object I want to, to, to refer to first, I can start typing in the name. And if I type in letter M, it will jump immediately in the list to the first items beginning with the letters M. If I carry on typing more letters, I'll see that my list gets ever shorter, so I can type in M, E, S, and the list will be limited to items that only match the words you've, the letters you've typed in so far. If I wanted to type in the rest of the word now, that the word message box is highlighted, I can simply press the tab key, for example, and that will type in the rest of the word and leave me with the next instruction to type in. Now, if you didn't even know which word you wanted to type in, which letters you wanted to begin with, you can actually display the IntelliSense list, as it's called, using a keyboard shortcut. So if I backspace the word message box away, I can press Control and Space. So hold down the Control key and press the space bar to display the IntelliSense list. It will pop up with the last word that you accepted from the list, but you can then scroll up and down through the list using either the arrow keys or the scroll bar to find the exact word that you want.
So again, as I say, I'm going to use the uh, the message box keyword. So I'm going to type in M E, and that should highlight the word message box. Then I can press the tab key to type in the rest of that word, and then decide what I want to do to it. You'll see at this point that because I haven't completed the instruction yet, I've got a squiggly red underline indicating there's some kind of error. If I hover the mouse over that particular part of the text, I'll get a little pop-up telling, telling me that what the error is. Um, it's a little bit premature if you ask me. I haven't even had a chance to finish writing the statement out. But if you see this sort of squiggly red underline with a completed instruction, or what you think is a completed instruction, then you know there's some sort of a problem. So let's continue writing out our instruction to display the message box. We've referenced a type of object or a class of object here, the message box class. What I need to do now is say what thing I would like to do to it. So this is the way sentences are, are pretty much built in C Sharp. You refer to the thing that you want to do something to, and then you say what you want to do to it. And there's a, a, a piece of punctuation that separates the thing from the action, and in C Sharp it's the full stop. So if I've typed in message box and then I type in a full stop, I'll see a list of things that I can do to the object that I've referred to. So what I want to do to my message box is I want to show it. So if I scroll through the list or I can type in letters, if I type in letter S, that will jump to the first item beginning with that letter. And then again, to type in the rest of that word, I can simply press the tab key on the keyboard to type it in. Now obviously I haven't completed this instruction yet because I still have a squiggly red underline. I've said that I want to apply the show method to an object of the message box class, but I haven't yet said what message I want to display. So to specify that, I need to open a set of parentheses, shift and the number 9 on my laptop keyboard. One of the nice things about this edition of Visual Studio is it actually closes the parentheses for me as well, which I think is just great. And then a little tooltip pops up explaining how I can complete the rest of this instruction. So you can see that I've got message box dot show and in a set of parentheses it's saying string text. So what this means is that there's a parameter to fill in. I need to pass an argument into this parameter that says what text to display on the message. This is actually just one of 21 different ways to complete the message box instruction or the dot show method at least. If I want to see what the other options are, I can click on the little um, down arrow to scroll through the list. So I can see there's another what's referred to as an overload of the show method that says I can pass in um, the Windows owner as well as a string of text that represents the message. And if I carry on scrolling through, I'll see lots and lots of different variations on how to complete the show method of the message box class. So there's one that shows a string, uh, which is the text of the message, then another one which is another string of text, which is the caption of the message. I'm going to go back to version number one. It doesn't actually matter which one you've got selected in this list, by the way, either. Even if I select one that's completely unrelated to um, to the one I'm, I'm about to use, I just want to specify which message I, I show on the message. So I'm going to open up a set of double quotes here. And again, beautifully, I get the closed double quote symbol added for me automatically. Then I can type in what message I want to display, which will just be something like, uh, welcome to Woda. Right at the end of the instruction, then, what I need to do every instruction in C-sharp ends with a semicolon character. So you still, see I've still got this squiggly red underline here, and if I hover the mouse just over it, you might just be able to make out that it says semicolon expected. So if I move over to the, uh, to the end of the line and I type in the semicolon, hit enter, and that's that instruction complete. So far we haven't saved any of the changes we've made to this procedure. So you can see the lines you've changed in the editor are highlighted in yellow on the left hand side. That indicates the changes you've made but have not yet been saved. So one simple way to save this file is to simply click the save button at the top. And you'll also notice that you've got a little asterisk symbol next to the, the tab name indicating you've made a change that hasn't been saved. If I click the save button we'll find that that asterisk disappears and the yellow lines turn green. So now I guess we should simply check that our method works, and to do that we'll need to run the application. Now we looked briefly at how to do that in the previous video, but essentially all you need to do is, assuming that you've got all the default settings set, is click on the start button. So if I do that by clicking the start button at the top of the screen, I'll see that my form should run, doesn't matter what you've got active on screen. So here's my form displayed, and I've got an apply now button. If I click this it should trigger the method we've written, the event handler, to display another message on screen saying welcome to the Woda. How immensely satisfying. Um, obviously that's horrendously simplistic, 
but it's hopefully enough to demonstrate at this point how to write basic code to respond to simple events of a Windows form. So I'm going to click OK on the message and then I'm going to close down my Welcome to Woda form and then that will take me back to the code and I can close down the output window which doesn't really give me any useful information at this point and see what else we can do with our code. Maybe we can start by passing in a few more values to some of the extra parameters of the show method to make our message box look a little bit more interesting. So as well as displaying the text on the message, if we click into the parentheses just after the string of text we've, we've passed into the, the title, or sorry, the text parameter, we can type in a comma to redisplay our tooltip. Then again, if we scroll through the list of overloads for the show method, we can see that there's another one that lets us specify the caption, and that's the, the text that appears in the title bar of the message box. So, I don't know, let's put in um, uh, another set of double quotes, and inside there we can say, I don't know, something like, um, uh, Woad application? I don't know. Anything will do, just for demonstration purposes. Then if I type in another comma, it will expand to another overloaded method. So this uh, this is the, the fifth overload of the show method. So this is showing me the, that there's a third parameter here I can specify, which is message box buttons. So with message box buttons, this is this is something that has to be a specific range of values. I can't just choose whatever I want to display here. So one really useful thing to be able to do at this point, when you have a specific data type for a, for a parameter, if you press the control and space keyboard shortcut, that will pop up and show you some information about what you can do to specify that. So if I've got message box buttons listed here, I can press tab to type that in, followed by a full stop, and that will provide me with a list of the available options. So I'm just going to choose to display, um, let's say, an OK button. So I'm going to choose OK by selecting it in the list and pressing tab. Then I can type in comma again to bring up another parameter. So this is the seventh overload of the method. I've got something called message box icon. So similar to message box buttons, if I press control and space on the keyboard, that will display message box icon. And then I can type that in by pressing tab, followed by a full stop, which provides me with a list of options. So I'm going to go with, oh, I don't know, let's say information let's say. I'm going to go with the information symbol. If I press tab to type that in, I'm just going to click onto any other line of code at this point, or use the cursor to, to click on another line of code, just to make sure that I don't get any squiggly red underlines indicating that there's a problem with that particular, um, what, I've, what I've written out. So if I just run my application one more time, and this time when I click on the apply now button, I should see a slightly more interesting message, having passed in a few more parameters. So I've got my caption, I've got my OK button, and I've got my information symbol as well. Click OK, and then close the form to end the application, and close the output window as well. When you've written a fairly long line of code like this, it can be quite awkward to read because you have to keep on scrolling backwards and forwards, left and right. So one of the nice things about the c -sharp language is that there's no limit to the number of lines you can write a single instruction over. The instruction only ends when you have the semicolon character at the end of the actual instruction. So if I wanted to, and this is a common way to do it, if I separate out each individual argument onto its own separate line, I can click just inside the parentheses and then hit enter. And then after the next comma, hit enter again. And after the next comma, enter it again. And after the next comma, enter again. It's entirely up to you where you put the parentheses. Now, I know that some people prefer to have the parentheses on individual separate lines, um, even to the point where you have a single parenthesis on a single line, and then potentially indenting all these other lines in between. So if I select all of these other lines, you can press the tab key to indent them. So that kind of makes the parenthesis um, syntax, oh sorry, um, parenthesis layout a lot like the curly brace layout. So you see everything inside the curly braces is, in, is indented one single line. Um, very much up to you what you prefer to do, what you think is the most sensible look. I tend to prefer if I backspace off those brackets and I put the end brackets after the last parameter, that's the, the layout that I tend to prefer myself, but it really is entirely up to you. The, just it's, it's nice that you have the flexibility, essentially, to write out a single line of code across multiple lines. 
Another way that we could improve this basic message is to read some information from the form itself. So on the form design view, if I select my first name text box, I'll see it's got a name called first name text box, which is nice and unambiguous. And what I might want to do is read whatever information a user has typed into there to display it on the message. So if I wanted to do that back in the code view of my form, what I need to do is add some extra information to the end of the um, text parameter. So to add some more text to the end of that, I need to use a plus symbol, which is the symbol for concatenation in C Sharp. So it allows you to join bits of text together. You'll see at this point I've got a squiggly red underline because again I've made a currently I've got a syntax error. Essentially, I've used the plus symbol, but I haven't said what I want to add to the end of this string of text. So I'm going to type in a space just after the word woda to make sure that I get a space before the user's name. And then after the plus symbol, I'm going to reference the first name text box control on the form. So as soon as I start typing first name, again, my IntelliSense list appears. And I'll see that I get in the IntelliSense list items beginning with the, the words I'm typing in. So I've got my first name text box, which I've clearly distinguished from my first name label. Once I've finished typing that in, I can either press the tab key or I can also press the full stop as well. I should have mentioned that earlier. You can press the full stop key to type in a highlighted word. And if you type in the full stop, it will also then immediately show you the IntelliSense list for the item you're referring to. So my first name text box has a number of methods and properties. So the properties are these little spanner symbols, as we're seeing here. The methods are the little boxes, as we saw earlier, for the show method. So the particular property I'm interested in for the text box is the text contained within it. So there's a property in here called text. Here's some of the methods, these little sort of purple box looking symbols. Methods, uh, the properties, as I say, are the little spanner symbols. The little lightning flashes, as we've seen, are the events of the object. So I would like to refer to the text property of the first name text box. So I've got that selected. I can press tab to type the rest of it in. And then all the squiggly red underlines will disappear. And that means now that if I run my application again by clicking the Start button, I can type in a name into the text box. So I can say Andy. And when I click Apply Now, my message will say Welcome to Woda Andy. So it's reading the text property of that object. Click OK, close the form down, and then close the output window. You can, of course, join together multiple bits of information. So after my first name text box is text, I might want to join on the last name text box as text as well. And I'd want to make sure that there was a space in between those two. So after the first name text box dot text, I can type in another space and another plus symbol. And then I want a literal space. So inside a set of single, uh, sorry, double quotes, I can type in a space character and then another plus symbol and then reference the last name text box. So again, if I start typing, the IntelliSense list appears. I can select the last name text box using the cursor keys, type in a full stop, and look for the text property. Once I've got that highlighted, I can press tab to type the rest of the word in, and then click onto another line or use the cursor keys to move to a different line, just to make sure that I don't get any syntax errors. Now again, because this line is um, quite long, it's more than acceptable to break this down onto multiple lines. So after welcome to Woda plus first name text box, I might want to put in a new line. So I can press enter there to put that on a new line. If I was doing this in the real world, uh, I probably wouldn't bother because I'd be using a much smaller font size in the first place rather than the one that I'm using here. But if I was doing this in the real world, I'd probably use a tab character to indent this one more space as well, just to indicate that I am um, continuing one single argument here. So I could use another enter at the end of that line there. So that indicates that all of that is part of one single argument. Then this is the next argument and so on and so on. Again, it's very much personal preference. It's whatever makes sense and makes your life easier. So feel free to do whichever you think. Again, just bear in mind that you've got this flexibility and you've got completely free choice over how to lay out your code. What we should do now is test that this actually works, of course. So let's start the procedure again. Let's sorry, start the application by clicking the start button. And I'll type in two names this time. I'll type in my first name and my last name. So I'll type in, um, in fact, let's type in Wise Owl. So I type wise in one and owl in the other and click the apply now button and we'll see welcome to Woda wise owl click OK close the form and then close the output window 
So, we've written a procedure which shows a simple message on screen, but that's always the first thing you do whenever you learn a new programming language. Show a boring old message that says hello world or something like that. So let's write another procedure that now will actually do something to the form itself. So it might change a few properties or perform a few methods on some of the objects on the form. So to do that, we're going to go back to the design view of the form first of all. And I'm going to add another button onto the form. Um, let's write one that just clears the contents of any items like the first name and last name text boxes and the your gender and their gender combo boxes. So we're going to add another button using the toolbox. So I'm going to display that by clicking on the toolbox and I'm going to drag a button from the toolbox onto the form. It should be second nature to you by now if you followed the previous video in the series. And that button, I'm going to change its name so that it's, uh, so if I go to the properties window and I look at the properties rather than the events, I'll change the text so that it says clear form and then I'm going to go back to the name property and I'm going to change that so that it says clear form button. What I can now do is go to the events tab and find the click event and double click on that and we'll go back to exactly the same code page we were just looking at so it's exactly the same file the world application form.cs file but I've generated a new event handler called clear form button click. Let's start with a quick comment that describes what we're going to do. And to begin with, what we'll do is clear the contents of the first and last name text boxes. So a quick comment with two forward slashes, clear first and last name text boxes. Nice and simple. Then on the next line, we're going to write the code that will clear the first name text box first of all. Now again, the syntax for this, the, the layout of the code you write to do this is, is fairly similar to what we did with messagebox.show. So we refer to the object first and then a full stop and then what we wanted to do to that object. So I need to start by writing um, or referring to the first name text box. So there it is in the IntelliSense. Then I can type in a full stop and say what I want to do to it. And what I want to do to it is to clear it. So if I start typing clear, it will select the clear method from the list. So it has the same symbol as the show method has next to it, this little purple box symbol. So first name text box dot clear, followed by a tab. Then with the show method, there were several bits of information we had to specify to make the method, uh, to make the message box appear. So we had to say what message we wanted to display. Now with the clear method, there isn't actually any information to display um, or, or any extra parameters to set, but we do have to make sure that we open and close the parentheses. Every method that you use in C Sharp has to have the open and close parentheses after its name. So you can see again in the um, in the uh, little tooltip that pops up, it says clear here with an open and close parenthesis. It doesn't have any parameters, it doesn't have any overloads like the show method had. It had 21 different overloads. There's just one way to use the clear method, and that's literally to say just clear. And again, we mustn't forget here, you can see the little squiggly red underline saying it expects a semicolon. So we type in the semicolon, that completes that instruction. We can do exactly the same thing then for the last name text box. So we can say last name text box dot look for the clear method and again we must open and close a set of parentheses so open and close then make sure we add the semicolon to the end and that will perform those two instructions so let's give this one a quick test to make sure that it works if we start the application by clicking the start button and then type some information into the first and last name text boxes we can say Y's and owl again, and then click the clear form button. It should apply those methods to those objects, and that's exactly what it does. So those two instructions work quite happily. Let's close the form down and click on the cross to close the output window. Let's work out how we can do the same sort of thing for the combo boxes, for the gender combo boxes. Clearing the text from a combo box is similar but not identical to that for a text box. So we're going to add another little comment. Let's give myself a blank line in the same procedure. And I'm going to add another comment that says clear text from gender combo boxes. Or, yeah, something like that. Gender combo boxes will do. That should be make it uh, fairly obvious what we're trying to do. Then we need again to start by referencing the object we're trying to modify. So the name of the object in this case will be your gender list. So that's the name of the comma box that I created. It shows me that it's the comma box in the in the uh, little tooltip there. If I type in a full stop then and I look for the clear method, I won't find that in the list. Um, what I need to do instead for a combo box is to find the method called reset text. So it's a completely different method which essentially does the same thing. So if I choose reset text and open and then close some parentheses, type in the semicolon at the end, and then likewise for their gender list dot reset text, 
open and close in parentheses, and then close the semicolon at the end. So again, we're using a method to um, to affect an object. So it's object, full stop, method name, open and close parentheses, and a semicolon to end. So the reset text method doesn't have any parameters either, just like the clear method doesn't. But the, as again we say, the show method had several parameters with several different overloads that we could specify. So one more test to make sure that this one works. Let's start the application again by clicking the start button. And when the form appears, we can type in some text into the first text box and into the second text box, and choose items for the uh, for the two combo boxes. Click the clear form button, and those properties will be removed. What I'd like to do next is add some more code which resets the values of the age boxes when we click the clear form button. So rather than clear out their contents altogether and make them blank, I want them to go back to their original values which is 18 and 100. So to do that I'm going to go back to the code file for the form and just below where we've, where we've reset the drop down lists we can add another blank line, another comment which will say reset age boxes. And then again, we need to start by referencing the object that we want to modify. So the names of these objects were called minimum and maximum age. So if I, if I call the first one, or refer to the first one as minimum age spinner, and then I can type in a full stop so that I can see a list of its methods and properties. Now, as I say, I didn't want to, to clear the contents of this. What I want to do is set its value back to its original. So rather than using a method to perform an action, what we're going to do is change one of its properties. So the property that we're going to change is going to be called the value property. So if you look in the list for the value property, you'll see it has this spanner symbol next to it. So it's clearly not a method, it's not one of those little purple boxes, it's a property that we can change. Now properties don't have the parentheses added to the end of their name. When you want to change the value of a property, what you need to do is set it to be equal to something. So I'm going to set the value of the minimum age spinner box to have a value of 18. So as that's just a, a, a number, I can type that in without any qualifiers, so I can just type in the, the number literally, then type in a semicolon at the end. And then the same thing for the maximum age spinner, so I say maximum age spinner dot value equals, and in this case it will be 100, and don't forget the semicolon at the end. So that's the, uh, the major difference between methods and properties. A method is usually just uh, a reference to the, the word, the action you want to perform, and it always has parentheses after its name, regardless of whether you pass values into its parameters or not. So here we clearly do for the messagebox.show method, but here we clearly don't for the clear or reset text methods. For a property, you don't use parentheses, you make the value of that property equal to something. So that might be a number, or it might be a string of text, or some other value altogether. But you must use an equal sign to set its value, like so. So we should just give this a quick test by running the application again, so let's start it. And we can try typing something into the text boxes, and choosing genders, and then try setting the values of the text boxes to different numbers. And when we click the clear now button or clear form button, we should find that everything goes back to its original state. Close the form down and then close the output window as well. For the final thing we'll do in this video, we're going to add one more button to the form that allows the user to quit from the application altogether. So to do that, we can head back to the form and design view. And I'm going to give myself a little bit more space at the bottom of the form. And I'm going to draw another button using the toolbox. So I'm going to drag one on again, and I'm going to call this button, if I look at the properties in the properties window rather than the events, I'll change the text on the button so that it says quit, and then I'm going to change the name of the button so that it's called quit button. What I can then do is go to the events page of the properties window and look for the click event and double click on that to generate another event procedure or event handler for the click event of the quit button. Now when this button's clicked, I'd like three separate things to happen. First of all, I'd like the form itself to disappear from view. Then I'd like to have a message appear on screen. And then finally, I'd like the application itself to quit. So I need to do this to three separate instructions, or write three separate instructions to make those three things happen. So let's start with making the form disappear. Again, just like with all the other lines of code we've written, we need to refer to an object first, or refer to a thing. And the thing I want to manipulate here is the form itself. When I'm writing code inside a form, the simplest way to refer to it is to use the keyword called this. 
this keyword refers to the class that your code is stored inside, or the instance of the class that your code is stored inside, to be more technically correct, I suppose. And the class that we're writing our code within is, of course, our Woda application form, as it was defined at the very top of this page, as we saw earlier on. So when I re refer to the word this, it means the form itself. I can then type in a full stop and see a list of all its methods and properties. So we've got things like show, which will make it appear on screen. Um, what I want to do is to actually make the form's visible property equal to false. So if I say this dot visible, you can see it's a property rather than a method. It's got a little spanner symbol next to it rather than a little purple box. So I can say dot visible equals false. Type in a semicolon at the end and that changes the visible property. So it's, as I say, it's a property, so we don't use the parentheses at the end, just like the value property of the uh, the up-down spinner buttons, the numeric up-down controls. So making the visible property equal to another value. We know how to make a message box appear, so we can do that fairly easily. We can say message box dot show, and that's a method. You can see it's a little purple box, so we need to open a set of parentheses. And inside there, we need to write at least one, or pass in at least one value to one parameter, the, the text parameter. So the one I'm going to just say uh, for the text, I'm just going to say bye-bye. And then at the end, don't forget to add the semicolon to end the instruction. And then finally, to quit the application altogether, there's a keyword that refers to the application which unsurprisingly is the word application, so that's the application class. That refers to the entire application you're running. Then if I type in a full stop after that, we'll see a list of all of its methods and properties. The method I want to perform is the one called exit, and it's clearly a method, it's got a little purple box next to it. So because it's a method, I need to open and close some parentheses. There are two overloads of the exit method, so with the second overload I can pass something into the E parameter, which is the cancel event args, but I don't want to do that in this case. I'm just going to use the standard version of the exit method. So I don't pass anything into the parentheses, I just add a semicolon at the end, and those are those three instructions written. All that remains then is to give this procedure a quick test. So we can do that once again by starting the application with the start button, and what we'll do when the form finally appears, we can click our quit button and three separate things should happen. The first two will happen very quickly in, in sequence. So when I click, click quit, the main form will disappear and then immediately a, a message box will appear with the words bye bye. Finally, when I click the OK button, the application itself will quit entirely. So we'll go back to the main Visual Studio window with the output window displayed and I can close down the output window just as I close the application using the cross in the top right hand corner. So that's the end of the video on writing basic c -sharp code. I know we haven't done anything particularly complicated yet, but that was kind of the intention. This was in designed as an introduction to writing symbol code. What you have done is you've seen the main basic elements of writing code in c -sharp, particularly in a Windows Forms application. So we saw the idea that objects on a form have events, which you can see using the properties window. You can attach code to those events by generating an event handler simply by double clicking on the event you want to access. In the code page, in the code file, you can then write code that does a variety of different things. Although we've dealt with a few simplistic things at this point, we've, we've seen some of the main elements of writing instructions in C-sharp. So the fact that whenever you write an instruction, you begin by referencing an object or a type of, or a class of thing. So we've seen message box, we've seen references to objects on the form or controls on the form. We've also seen the application object as well. After you've referenced the object, you type in a full stop, and then you either apply a method, which might be as simple as just stating a keyword and then opening and closing a set of parentheses, or it might be a little bit more complex, where you state the method name, like show, open the set of parentheses, and then pass in a number of different arguments. For a property, rather than using parentheses, you set the property to be equal to another value. So here we've seen using symbol numbers, we've also seen using the false keyword to pass in a Boolean value. Every statement, every instruction in C-sharp also ends with a semicolon, and that's something we've seen as well. So although we have, as I say, we haven't done anything massively complicated, you have got a reasonably good grounding in the basic syntax of C-sharp. So the next few videos are going to go into a bit more detail about some more sophisticated things you can do when you write code. So uh, let's save that for next time. If you like what you've seen here, why not head over to the YSL website where you can find loads more free resources including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials, and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching, see you next time.